in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter number 61. We'll spend this time on Father's Day, Juneteenth weekend, the sacred and holy collisions of this particular sense of holy days. Isaiah, as some of you may have heard me say many, many times, is uh, a major prophet in the history of Israel, the history of the Hebrew people, uh, the Jewish nation that finds its through line all the way back to a couple thousand years before the coming of Christ and uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of these patriarchal figures, if you will, who understood through revelation and interaction with God that they were called to be a consistent presence of reminding their family, their clans, their villages, their people, their nation, that their life and their existence was in the service of the God of creation who established a covenant, a promise, a way of life that they, as long as they lived within and along that trajectory, the, the God of creation, they were promised would always cause them to defeat every enemy. They would be able to live in a land of plenty and promise and they would have trial and tribulation, but God would always bring them through on the other side. And there were moments in the life of some of uh, these individuals in the life of the nation where they fell off and they were not able to live up to uh, their commitments. And so uh, the prophets were called to often remind the children of Israel of their covenant responsibility, of the promise they made with God and of the promise that God made with them. And so you find this prophet Isaiah, uh, it is thought that he uh, was largely offering his prophetic ministry to the children of Israel as they were coming out of exile. They had been in exile for quite some time and, you know, they have, uh, you know, scholars and uh, uh, biblical um, hermeneutical Giants have divided the book of Isaiah into several parts. They call them three parts of Isaiah. You have the Isaiah who is reminding the children of Israel uh, before they went into uh, bondage. You have the part of Isaiah that was reminding and calling the children of Israel while they were in bondage to not forget God. And then you had the children of Israel being reminded post exile, how can you reestablish this commitment to God because God's commitment remains with us. And so this prophet is speaking, and this is a very familiar passage of scripture because Jesus uh, read these words when he was uh, introducing his ministry to the people uh, in the temple uh, in the first century BC. So we've heard this passage of scripture, I'm sure plenty of times, Luke chapter four recounts this, but this was first spoken by the prophet uh, to the people and I believe it is an open invitation for all of us, uh, particularly those who are standing in the gap at the intersection of these places and spaces where bondage and where lack exist in our communities. This is, I think, a very apropos passage, and I invite you to open your heart and mind to see how may God speak to us today in light of these words. This is what the scripture says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting 
of the Lord to display God's glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities and the devastations of many generations. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, we're going to spend a few moments talking from the topic, be like the oaks. Be like the oaks. Bow your heads with me, and let's just ask the blessing of the Lord on this passage and on this time of preaching. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes the preaching and the teaching of your word easy. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Now, the scripture is very clear, particularly in verse number three. And they and we will be called oaks of righteousness. That God in God's divine plan and God's divine power has planted us, particularly according to this passage, in unique and particular places. So we can be a continuous display of God's faithfulness and God's power. You, everybody say, I I. am an oak of righteousness. That is our potential, praise God, to be an oak of righteousness. And if you are someone who uh, plants trees or if you are someone who is familiar with the process of what an oak is uh, turning into from its earliest days, you will know that an oak can be planted, but it may not necessarily become an oak. Amen. An oak only is defined as an oak when it reaches its full maturity. And sometimes if you're not a well-trained uh, uh, I, I forgot the name of the, 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 the horticulture. Is that, is that what we're talking about? Arborist? I knew it was one of them words. <laughs> if you're not a trained arborist, you may not appreciate the difference between a shrub and an oak in its earliest formations. But it's always important to remember that what a arbor, a untrained arborist may not appreciate. I am glad that God is always conscious of how God intends us to be. You and I are created to be oaks. Now, an oak is a tree with a deep system of roots, meaning that uh, some oaks will have roots that are as long and deep as the tree is above ground. What you see above the ground may not always tell you about the depth below the ground. And there are things that you and I, that we must be willing to appreciate uh, that have to be cultivated if we are to be an oak of righteousness. Now, as we continue to exist in the vein of Pentecostal uh, uh, celebration vis-a-vis the day of Pentecost, it's always a powerful opportunity to be reminded that the day of Pentecost literally unleashed the public conscious awareness of the power and activity of God's spirit. That in a time when folks were aware that God was around and God was moving, the Holy Spirit made it explicit. The Holy Spirit made it undeniable. The Holy Spirit infused itself in the life of people that were thirsty for God in such a way that they began to engage in practices that constantly caused their spirit to be fortified. 
can you imagine that one of the most important cultivating factors in an oak of righteousness is to have a vibrant spirituality that is intended to deepen your roots with God. So no matter what's happening above the ground, you have something happening away from the naked eye that can keep you grounded when all the external elements are attempting to chop you down. Lord, help me in here today. I mean, you know, it's really important to appreciate that an oak can have such deep roots that you can cut off everything above ground and the power of what's going on below ground will cause everything that cut, cut, got cut off above ground to eventually grow back. Lord, you, you missing it. You ought to tell your neighbor, amen. Don't, don't, don't count me out just because stuff been cut off above ground. Lord, I, I don't know. That, that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks, praise God. Amen. You ought to tell another neighbor, God's growing me back, praise God. There's, there, there's, there's some bounce back in my roots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so it's, it's really important, child of God, to keep reminding yourself that you are an oak. And why must you remind yourself of that? Because we live in a world that is constantly trying to diminish what God created us to be. Now, you must appreciate that there is a reason why people would rather have you be a shrub than an oak. Mm -hmm. Because oaks take up space. Oaks, when they get strong enough, you can't really control an oak. Yeah. You can hope to contain an oak, but if you give the oak some time, that oak will come back. Yeah. You can't dig up an oak. I mean, the energy it takes to do so will have you feeling like, man, I should have left this oak alone. Hello, somebody. How many of you are conscious that of all the hell you've had to go through, you are still here. And not just here without purpose, because the scripture says that the oak is there to remind the people of the glory of God. You, me, we, particularly who are fathers, are intended to be a constant reminder of God's glory. And I am someone who appreciates that uh, there is indeed a consistent attack and diminishing and erasure of fathers in the zeitgeist of how we talk about so much that happens in our community. We were able and have been able to host conversations at the Kahinde Wiley exhibit at the De Young Museum. And I want to appreciate everyone who's been coming out to support these conversations. And yesterday, we had four fathers who have lost their children to police violence. And it was a very powerful conversation with these fathers who have been active in their children's lives from the beginning and how they confessed that it was so painful for them to be erased out of their child's narrative because of a social presupposition that they are the cause because of their absence or their lack of parenting, they are the cause of their children's death and demise. And to hear these fathers talk and some weep and some express their anger and guilt and isolation because of the loss of their children and the narrative that was created to try and make sense of the state's violence towards their child and, and absolve the state and lay the blame at the feet of these fathers. 
And one of the fathers said very powerfully, uh, I've known uh, Joseph, Andrew Joseph, for well over six or seven years, and it was the most powerful thing. One of the things he said was, we are here not asking for human rights. We're just asking to be treated as good as an animal. He said, because you could not do to my son, or you could not do to a German shepherd what they did to my son. You could not shoot that German shepherd. You could not pick that German shepherd up from someone else's house and throw it into the middle of a highway and leave them abandoned. You could not, uh, you know, uh, put your foot on the neck of a German shepherd that you would be convicted of animal cruelty. And yet so many of our family members and community members are finding themselves being treated worse than you would an animal with no accountability. And what became so clear to me in the voice of these fathers was this sense that their emotional capacity, as one said, had to be broken wide open during the grieving process of their child. That they had to figure out how to display humanity, but also a sense of healing, a process that allowed them to move beyond the worst moments and experiences of their lives. And I want to argue that that is another part of what it means to be an oak of righteousness on display to the glory of God. That even when you and I are experiencing our worst moments, God heals us along the way as a way to be displaying that God's healing capacity is more than enough. It will meet you and I wherever we are, and it will always be more than enough. I love the way then that the NIV version talks about what the oak of righteousness will be. Verse number four in the NIV says they will rebuild ancient ruins. That's one of the first things I want you to appreciate as an oak of righteousness, that you and I are called to rebuild some things that have been ruined. You and I are called to rebuild relationships that have been ruined, to rebuild our own lives that have sometimes been left in the ruins, to rebuild our communities that have at many times been left in the aftermath of systemic and structural violence. And the oak is an oak of righteousness when it is activated to rebuild and not to just take up space. Uh -huh. You can't just take up space and be an oak of righteousness. In order for you to be an oak of righteousness, an uh, oak that has right action, your action must be used rightly to rebuild things that have been ruined. How many of you can be honest and say, there are some things I need to rebuild as a father? that I tore down. Oh, I wish I could talk to somebody who can be honest. How many of you know that, you know, they don't give you a manual on how to raise kids. Most of us are using the manual from our parents. Hello, somebody, without the updates. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Amen. It's like this, this manual, this manual got its roots back, amen, in the indigenous times. <laughs> Man, put you out in the sweat house and just let you just sweat it out. It's like, okay, that, 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 that worked for some back then. And, and much love to Brother Patrick and those who still at the sweat house. I'm going to go with you one of these times, praise God. But how many of you know that if that's your only solution as a father or a parent to just put your child in the sweat house and let you sweat, that's, that's the best I can do. Just go on outside and play. Figure it out. How many of you know that you may have contributed to some ruin? Some of us, amen, have to rebuild a healthy sense of self in ourselves and in our children. Amen. If you've grown up in a home and your father was an abuser, you have to learn how to rebuild a healthy 
sense of fatherhood. Hello, somebody. Or else you will pass down to your child a manual that has not been updated. And I just find it so fascinating that everyone seems to think that their manual is the best manual out there. And, and you know, I want to argue that no one's manual stands on its own. We have a community and a collective wisdom that you and I must search out if we are to rebuild that which has been ruined. And so oak of righteousness is someone who is using the space that has been given to rebuild the ruins in yourself, in your family, in your community. You don't get to pick and choose how you rebuild. Amen. I remember uh, one of the times where I was uh, in a meeting in San Francisco in Hunters Point after I came back from school. I think it was me with Dr. Marshall or somebody. And they told me one time, they said, it's great to see you back here at Hunters Point because you have to rebuild some of the stuff you helped to tear down. That always stuck with me. Because <laughs> I, I was not the most hoodlumish of children because my father was not a to be messed with or joked around with, amen. But you know, we hung out with a lot of folk who, you know, tore things down and y'all was guilty by association, amen. I look out guy, oh, the first one to run and I could run real fast back then. I was a lot mobile and athletic, praise God. But it stuck out to me that there have been those who remember, have a sense of history of the harm that some of us have caused. Our job is to do the work so we can show back up as a rebuilder and not someone who continues to tear down. Some folk think it's just good enough for you to be there. No. I mean, it's better than nothing. But why would you want to be an oak of righteousness whose litmus test is it's better than nothing? How many know God wants us to be way better than nothing? And so the next thing that the NIV describes is that then we must be a restorer of the places long devastated. Rebuilding and restoring. Rebuilding is about, as we stated, building things back that have been torn down. But restoring is about putting things back in its rightful place. Rebuilding is different than restoring. At least I want to argue this morning that you can rebuild some things, but if they're not in their rightful place, again, it's better than nothing. But I'd like to have some restoration in our communities, in our families, in ourselves. God put things back in right order inside me, in my family, in my family unit, in my community, in my neighborhood, in this world. It's hard for things to function smoothly if everything is out of order. And for some of us, the work of decolonization is necessary. And to decolonize means you, you know, do a exorcism of sorts. <laughs> an exorcism of the westernized, white supremacist normativities. So you're like, what is he talking about? <laughs> I'm talking about all the things that have made you think and believe that you being created in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made, is not enough for you to have inherent value and dignity, that you need the approval of some system and structure that you'll never meet, but you'll always feel, that robs you of your humanity, that tries to put you in a place where God did not intend you. God wants you and I to be people who are conscious that we are called to restore places that have been, as the scripture says, long devastated. 
long devastated. God's calling you to go back to some places and restore it. Put some things back in right alignment. This is the hardest work for many of us to do because sometimes it's easy to rebuild than it is to restore. Because restore to me means you got to get in and do some work that is less about your hands and more about your mind and your heart. How I many know oh, you can rebuild some things physically, but restoration is really about the consciousness, the internal work to be reminded of what things were intended to be. And how can I participate in reminding others who have been long abandoned, long devastated, that they don't have to be this way. And then the last thing it says is, it will renew the city. I do believe that rebuilding, restoring has a cumulative impact. That communities and cities cannot stay the same when oaks of righteousness are unleashed to rebuild and to restore. Whatever work you do personally ought to add up to communal liberation. Whatever work you do vocationally ought to add up to a more just society. Whatever work you do on a nine to five or in a volunteer capacity, when you get home, it ought to add up to God's kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. That renewing cities means that where you have violent neighborhoods, our work collectively, both rebuilding and restoring, ought to shift the material conditions of violence and death that have been too easily unleashed upon us. And this is why I do believe that your job, our job, our collective job is to be, as Jeremiah 17 says, a man who is blessed is one who trusts in the Lord and is planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. And listen, does not fear when he comes. When you're planted by the rivers of water, heat does not bother you because what's going on below is like a built-in air conditioner. It's like something that takes the bite out of every kind of threat that comes your way. Being an oak of righteousness does not absolve you from uh, being in danger of those who are trying to cut you down, but it does give you a built-in guarantee that even when threats come, I have more to me than you can see with your naked eye. I have the ability to learn and to love and to heal and to grow. I have the ability to bounce back and to keep moving and to keep uh, causing the, the branches and the roots to be deepened. I have the ability, as the scripture says, to not be anxious in the year of drought. Why? Because the roots keep me bearing fruit. Uh, and you and I need to be reminded from time to time, I'm not going to be like a shrub when God God created me to be an oak. I'm not going to allow circumstances to erase me when God is actually coloring in the blanks in my life. God is adding some pop to your life. Uh huh. Some of you are trying to figure out how is that happening? Every award you get, God's adding a pop to your life. Every promotion you get, God is adding a pop to your life. Uh, every restored relationship you have, God is coloring it in uh, and adding a pop to your life. Uh, and when you get the pop in, I wish I had a church in here, uh, then you will find that the confidence, uh, anybody ever know somebody who's love to pop their collar? Uh, you're looking at them, you're saying you, you should not be doing that. Uh, but somehow they have so much confidence. Uh, 
<laughs> that you forget what they're wearing and you just start looking at their confidence. Uh, I'm here to tell you today that you are an oak of righteousness uh, when you can allow the God of all creation uh, who has planted you uh, by the rivers uh, of the living water uh, and your roots are deeper than the branches that stretch to the sky. Uh, there's a confidence uh, in knowing that I uh, am an oak. Uh, I am God's. Uh, I have power you have not seen. Uh, I have strength you cannot take away. Uh, I have space uh, that is being used to renew, restore, and rebuild. Uh, and when the oaks of righteousness uh, get together uh, and start standing next to one another, uh, then you have a forest. Uh, and how many of you know uh, that a lot of things can happen in a forest? Uh, you can hide in a forest. Uh, you can be protected in a forest. Uh, you can thrive in a forest. Uh, God wants you and I uh, to be people uh, who understand I uh, and we uh, are oaks of righteousness. Uh, be like the oaks. Uh, don't be like a shrub. Uh, don't be like a weed. Uh, don't be like a little plant. Uh, but be like an oak uh, that's planted by God. Uh, you will win uh, if you are an oak. Uh, you will thrive uh, if you are like an oak. Uh, God uh, has planted you uh, to be an oak. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, stand with me, everybody. Grab the hand of an oak next to you. Look at him and tell him you ain't nothing but an oak. <laughs> Come on, tell him that you ain't nothing but an oak of righteousness that has been planted by God for the displaying of God's glory. And you must rebuild. You must rebuild some things that have been torn down. You don't get to be left off the hook, but you must do some physical work you must re-enter some places with the right spirit and rebuild you got some restoration work to do insides healing work work that causes you and I to be put back in our rightful place and then you have to be reminded you have work to renew the city. God, we want to be a people who can impact the whole spectrum of life that you've placed in our hands. Thank you on this Father's Day. Thank you on this Father's Day. Thank you on this weekend where we are reminded that freedom may sometimes be delayed but it is never denied. So as I touch my loved one today, I pray that you will remind them of who they are. Remind them of their vocation, their positionality, that they are called to be an oak. They're called to be someone who has sturdy foundations. They're called to be someone who can cultivate through the practices of prayer, the practices of fasting, the practices of service, the practices of study and worship. They can cultivate a spiritual foundation of roots that go so deep in the ground that it can never be dug up. So I pray, God, for the roots of my loved one who I'm touching. God, I pray for the healing of every hurt. On a day, God, when sometimes the pain of our relationships with our fathers surface hurt and trauma, I pray, God, for restoration. I pray for renewing. I pray for rebuilding. Why, God? Because we are your people. We are temples of your spirit. 
We are the church. We are your active presence in the world. And we must be healed and in the right position and on the right assignment to have maximum impact. So bless them today. This is our prayer. Lift your hands where you're standing. God, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. I want to be an oak today. I want to be reminded of what you've called me to be. Of how you've placed me strategically in community and in the world. I want to be reminded that your spirit that is at work within me God it always has the ability to grow me back to a place of displaying your glory so display it in me today somebody say heal me today somebody say save me today somebody say renew me today restore me today do it by the power of your spirit and we'll say thank you God for making us like the oaks in Jesus name we pray come on give two or three people a hug a high five and tell them be like the oaks today be like the oaks today affirm somebody else and tell them you are an oak praise God you are an oak Come on, give God a hand. Praise everybody. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord.